Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you are watching my walkthrough for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild for Nintendo Wii U and Switch. So we're continuing our massive circuit of Hyrule, just circling around and unlocking all of the towers and shrines that are right next to uh, stables so that we can have some nice teleport points and also access to a lot of great farming locations for materials that'll help us to upgrade all the armor we're collecting and also just give us a whole bunch of really good food that we can use that'll allow us to go to traverse all of the areas of the game with ease. So that's what we're going to be doing for this particular video. So this video right here is going to be me working my way towards Akala in the far top right corner of the map and getting the Lanero Tower along the way. So my first objective is to go to the Riverside Stable, which is in the bottom right corner of Hyrule Field. And I've mentioned this before, but your horse will automatically snap to roads. As long as you're walking in the general direction, or galloping in the general direction of a road, your horse will automatically steer itself to stay in the center of the road. And I didn't realize this. I was like weaving back and forth trying to keep my horse like going in the way I wanted it to because I thought I had to from like Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess and stuff. I didn't realize it would just automatically do it. But it's actually it's a feature I really like in Breath of the Wild now that I realize it's a thing. And so I feel silly about that watching this recording now. But anyways, at a certain point, you're going to have to ditch the road, though, and continue on to the north to bypass this and go straight to Riverside Stable. You can take the road, but there's, like, super long way to get there otherwise, and so it's just better to just cut across the field here. I think this shrine is really fun. The Wago Kata... These names, seriously, guys. <laughs> like, what is this? Um, so you want to climb the nearby metal blocks and then open the nearby chest to get an amber, which is great. And then what you want to do is just magnesis the bottom block and just slowly inch it over. As long as you don't make any sudden movements, then you should be fine and they should stay in a nice stack. So you don't have to, like, restack them every single time. Now what you want to do is just make sure that you make your stack go close enough to this far corner that you can grab this uh, plate, I guess you'd call it. A flat piece. The flat metal piece. So just make sure you're close enough you can grab that. And what I like to do is I put it at the exit because I'm going to need it there anyways. So I just put it there ahead of time. And then just go ahead and move your blocks close enough and just hopefully don't do any sudden movements to make it fall over. If it does, you'll just have to stack it back again. Luckily, they always write themselves whenever you pick them up. You know, if they ever make a Zelda VR game, I have a feeling that Magnesis is probably going to be like one of the kind of abilities that we'll have in that because it's uh, it's just right up there. You know, it's, it's just derpy enough for it to work <laughs> or something. I think it would actually be pretty cool to do that, but uh, hopefully you don't have as much trouble at this point as I did. <laughs> Uh, can I can I mess it up anymore? By the way, quick tip for you in case you didn't know is whenever you get to the end of any of these shrines, the old bro will then heal you automatically anyways. So I could have eaten some apples or something, but I wasn't too worried about it because I was like at the end of the shrine. Um, the only reason to eat it stuff would be to keep myself from dying, but that, that never happens. I never just take fatal damage, right? So by the way, after you meet Hestu the first time and you complete the Hestu's Priceless Maracas side quest, then you will then see him working his way towards uh, the Great Forest of Hyrule to the far north northeast, and that is where he's going to end up being at long last. However, until you go there for the first time, he will steadily like inch his way over there, and he just like he he moves just like a little bit at a time. So um, currently he's here at Riverside, and then he'll be at the next stable as well, murking his way towards the Woodland Stable area. So if you can keep um, yeah, if you unlock the stables in that order, like working your way north along with Hestu, you can then get some upgrades before you ever reach the Great Forest of Hyrule. So just a quick tip for you. Um, I don't think that he just ends up like teleporting all over Hyrule. He's just steadily working his way north, as he said he would. But it is kind of a nice way to get at least a couple upgrades here and there, as long as we're going that direction anyway. Now at each one of these locations at a varying amount of upgrades, then Hestu will then tell you that he's going to continue working his way north. I'm not actually sure what the determining factor is. I'm thinking it might actually be how many shrines you've completed is what determines whether or not he's going to cut you off or not. Next, you want to head west and then north to get to the wetland stable, and you can also get there by going from Kakariko. You go down the hill, there's no road there, you just go like down the hill and it's kind of steep and everything, but you can totally take your horse down it too. Um, I don't, there's not really a good way to get a horse to Kakariko though, other than coming from Dueling Peaks, but just as an interesting alternative, I don't think it's a good idea. I'm just mentioning it, the, the fact that you can. I think most people don't think you can go through there. Even though there's a road and everything like that, because there's not a road on the map, I don't think that people realize you can do that. But anyways, you want to work your way to Wetland Stable and then enter the um, Kayawan Shrine. I think this is probably one of the most awkward shrines in the game. Uh, it is cool, though, as far as a concept, but it is can be a little bit frustrating, especially if uh, you have bad things happen to you. So uh, what you want to do is just keep using Cryonis to get through the first room. It's pretty self-explanatory. Use it on the waterfall up ahead to make it go straight out. And then up ahead in the second room, you want to make sure you put one right up against the platform with the Guardian Scout, because if you are too far away, then you won't be able to jump to it. So just want to make sure that your block is close enough where you can climb up at that point. Um, it is a little bit awkward, but just make sure you use the Cryonis as a shield so that it can't hit you and then chase after it. 
As an alternative, for this entire shrine, you can always just shoot them in the eye. Um, Guardian Scouts actually get stunned if you shoot them in the eye, and it will, like, reset their attack animation and stuff. So if you just aim very carefully when they're charging up and stuff, then you can guarantee that they can't shoot you at all. So And you do additional damage anyways. You do double damage if you shoot them in the eye regardless. So that's pretty cool. Um, as another comment, too, if you haven't really used a lot of your shock and uh, frost arrows in particular, those are really good against Guardian Scouts. I think that, um, like, like, at least in my case, I end up with tons of shock arrows, and I'm not really sure what to do with them most of the time. I think Guardian Scouts are one of the best enemies to use them on because uh, it just stuns them for a long time. It does decent damage. It's just good. But yeah, that all being said, if you are like me, where I'm stalling and not using arrows, like, I should just, you know, suck it up and just do it. I'm just, like, stalling and hanging on to them because I feel like, oh, you know, eventually I'll need them. I won't want to use them all up because then eventually I'll need them and then I won't have them, you know? But if I'm not going to use them for a problem area like this, when am I going to use it, you know? So I would encourage you to, like, try and break that habit if you're like me and then <laughs> just use them anyway because we need to do it, you know? Now up ahead, I was trying to make this platform go on like the far side of this doorway, but I keep ending up making it do towards the beginning, so I ended up just giving up and just putting a block um, on the far side instead, so it would prevent my forward momentum, so that I could still go through the door. Anyways, um, this is like a little bit more complicated, you could probably do that with just one block and just open the far side of the door, but uh, whatever you gotta do. Now as far as these scouts, you can kill them if you want to, but all we're trying to do really is just get to the shrine at the end. You don't have to open up all the side chests if you don't want to. I do think that the ancient core that was in the second room was uh, pretty good though. Now you don't have to get that side chest in particular because it just has a knight's sword anyways and it's just kind of boo, it's bad quality. I mean, it'll eventually get better because it scales with the divine beast, but you could just ignore that and you don't even have to kill the scouts either. You can just like run in circles on the platform and just let it slowly take you to the waterfall and then as soon as you get there, just jump off. And that's all you really have to do. We're just trying to get to the old bro. You don't have to do anything else. So next, before we leave, I'm going to explore the forest just south of Wetland Staple. This area is one of the better places in the game to farm for enduring and hardy ingredients. Now, a lot of times those two different types are in completely different locations and you know you'll find you have a great farming place for just one of them but not the other one and so this place is kind of cool because we have both very cool place for speedrunning in particular but um, I don't think this is the best place to farm in the game but it is a good place all the ingredients here are just kind of mid-tier however any hardy ingredient can be cooked to make just by itself just one of them will completely restore all your hearts and similarly a single enduring ingredient will give you just a sliver of yellow stamina and completely restore all of your green stamina which is awesome so if you end up just gathering all this stuff and cooking each one of these by itself just a single ingredient you'll get like half a page of enduring ingredients and half a page of hearty ingredients which is great you just come back here every blood moon you get so many dishes that will like i don't know you can't die and you can climb anything it's just great so that all being said, I'd recommend you place a pin on your map here. It's just a really great place to farm. Now, in the middle of this area, there is a Korok, and it has some of those, like, thorny branches, whatever, around it. And you can burn this by... You, in order to burn it, you have to use either a fire arrow or you have to burn something else nearby. So what I did is I just threw down a chunk of wood and then lit that on fire, which then caused the twigs to burn, which is kind of weird. Like, you can burn grass, which is green and stuff and happy, and which is, you know, moist and stuff like that. Meanwhile, dried out twigs, you can't slash that with your sword. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know why they do it that way. So when you're done messing around here, hop back on your horse, continue on to the north to reach the Namaka Oz Shrine and Krennel Hills. Now, the Namaka Oz Shrine, I'm not going to actually complete it right now. I just want to unlock the warp point so that we can get here whenever we want. I'll do a whole bunch of those Test of Strength shrines here in a little while. I'm just stalling for now. Anyways, Krennel Hills is the best place in the entire game to get elemental rods. You can find them in chests and stuff, but those don't respawn with Blood Moons. You can find them on enemies, and some of them are just sitting on the ground, um, like I showed one in the last video, for example, that was just sitting in uh, near Tower. Jin Shrine. Uh, but anyways, uh, those higher quality rods are kind of hard to find. Most of them are on whiz ropes and you have to travel really far out of your way to get them and they're often kind of dangerous. There's lots of nasty enemies around and stuff. So anyways, the higher quality rods are somewhat hard to find, but the Namaka Oz Shrine here at Krennel Hills is amazing for this because there is one of each elemental type in quick succession, like right next to the shrine. So you can warp here and grab the really high quality rod and run away. These rods give you the highest elemental damage in the entire game. They have the highest damage potential, and they're amazing if you use them properly, and I want to talk about that for a little bit. I think most people don't actually know how to use these rods appropriately. One of the first things to know is that the white number that's in the tooltip, like in your inventory, is the physical damage of the weapon. So if you were to like run right up to an enemy and smack them at close range with the weapon itself, a rod would only do five damage physical damage, but then it does some additional elemental damage. Now the elemental damage on all these weapons is not listed. I don't really know why they don't have, I don't know why they didn't include that. It's kind of weird to me. Uh, but anyways, the elemental damage on most of the weapons, the, the regular swords and stuff, um, charge up over time. So you unleash the elemental effect, you have to wait for it to recharge, and then you 
you know, then you use it again and it's finally back up and running. So sometimes you're doing more damage, sometimes you're doing less. I'm not sure that people notice that most of the time, but anyways, it's very it's very important to note for the rods in particular. They have the highest damage elemental damage potential in the game which is really, really strong. But you have to use them properly because there is some nuance to each element. Now, one of the most obvious examples of that right away is the fact that frost weapons, you want to use those against fire enemies, and fire weapons, you want to use against ice enemies. Unfortunately, shock doesn't really have that stipulation. However, you have more options for shock resistance than you do for some of the other elements. So as a result, it's a lot easier to get shock resistance using buffs, either with armor or with food. And as a result, you don't take any damage from shock at all. So not only do you have to not have to worry about getting disarmed, you don't have to worry about damage from them whatsoever. So there is like nuances to it as far as uh, when you want to use them. Also, by the way, shock weapons do additional damage to wet enemies. Let's go. So moving on real quick. So as an example, you can use a fire arrow on the wizard robes. I think this is like the best way to deal with wizard robes in general. If you're fighting a fire or ice wizard robes, just always use the fire or ice arrows. It's just it's just cheap. Like we get so many of those arrows anyways. Um, you might end up using a lot of fire arrows just because you're lighting things on fire all the time. But I still think that's the best way to take care of those enemies. Otherwise, another fun thing you can do too is you can just throw your fire weapons at them too, just with the R button. And it's great. It just works really good. So whenever you kill whiz robes like this, you can just instantly run forward and grab their rods. So in this case, for example, I used a fire arrow to instantly kill it and then just run forward, grab his blizzard rod and run away. So in this way, you can warp to Namak Oz and then just go grab whatever elemental rod you want it, right next to the shrine and you're good to go. So make sure you grab this shrine before you leave and then now we have a warp point here so that we can come back here every blood moon, which is great. And those whiz robes will respawn and thus we can get more rods. Now, of all these rods, the higher quality ones are, of course, better, and there's one next... So I marked them on my map where each one of these, like, stump things are that each have a wizard robe. But the blizzard rod is by far the most powerful of these weapons. It's one of, probably the, one of the strongest weapons in the entire game. Super, super strong, and I will talk about that in more detail later. So, um, next thing I want to talk about is there is a bunch of elemental chews here. So you can hunt each one of the different elemental chews here, but I don't really think... Just to get their chew jelly of the different elements. But I don't think it's worth it because you can change... The the element of any chew jelly at any time using either environmental effects or using elemental weapons. So by killing regular chews like these ones right here and getting a bunch of regular chew jelly, they're a lot easier, they're less of a threat, and you get a whole bunch of chew jelly which you can change to whatever element you want. It's super easy, and by the way, when you do that, regular chew jelly is like garbage, it doesn't sell for anything, and the, the duration you get on elixirs is terrible, but if you change it to an elemental one of any type, it will increase the sell value and the... Um, the duration you get when you add it to elixirs, which is kind of funny. It's like super easy. You don't have to do like hardly anything. The deal with that, by the way, is you have to swing over it. So if you put the chew jelly on the ground, then like stand over it with a thunder blade, for example, you want to stand like on top of it and swing so that your swing goes over it, not like don't smack it directly. You need to just smack near it, and the elemental effect just like in the air will cause it to change. So that's how you do that. So that all being said, elemental chews are kind of scary because they can freeze you or set you on fire, or they disarm you when they shock you and stuff, and it's just annoying. Um, meanwhile, so you can just ignore them, just run right past them. Meanwhile, if you kill regular chews, especially in passing like that, like those two big fat ones I just killed, like they give me, each one of them gave me three, so I got six chew jelly. So if you fight a cluster of chews, you get somewhere between like six and 12 chew jelly at any given time. So you just kill them in passing. If you're just running past and you see a bunch of chew, big chews like that especially just kill them real quick throw a bomb at them whatever use anything you want and you get a whole bunch of chew jelly and like literally if you're fighting only regular chews just whenever they're convenient you will end up with enough <laughs> elemental chew jelly to get, to last for all the upgrades for everything you need to do for the entirety of breath of the wild super easy and you don't have to worry about the harder enemies at all make sense so i would just ignore elemental weapon elemental chews get regular chew jelly and change the element to whatever you want whenever you need it all right, I have a bunch more stuff to say about elemental weapons, but I, I need to get back to talking about the walkthrough. So I'm going to continue my elemental discussion here in just a little bit. So for right now, I'm heading to the she Sherada? Sherada? I don't, I don't know, dude. All these names. I don't know how you pronounce any of these things. So I'm heading to this shrine here in the middle. Uh, one of the nice things about this one is you can go either north or south either way. Um, now, this area is completely surrounded by a bunch of vines, and these uh, thorny vines, whatever, are a pain. You can't actually smack them directly with a fire weapon. You can use a fire arrow, but if you want to not waste that, one thing you can do is you can place a, um, a chunk of wood next to it and then set that on fire, and the nearby fire will cause the thorns to be burned up instead. Which, I'm not really sure why that's even a stipulation, but whatever, that's one way you can do this. One quick note about this is wait for all of the thorns to be burned up 
before you enter the shrine, otherwise they will reappear when you exit. So welcome to the Shea Rada Shrine. How this works is there is a crystal switch in the corner, and when you hit it with anything, it will then cause the water level to rise and lower. Now, uh, this will spin a laser if you spin this um, rotating duber over here, and what that'll do is it will hit the crystal switch after a delay. So if you want to, it to be delayed, you can use that. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to open up a nearby chest that is available only when the water is lowered. So do that real quick. So meanwhile, this platform is spinning, so this laser will then hit it. I think it's better overall to use bombs for this next part. So here's how this is going to work. What I'm doing is I'm placing a cryonis block over there so that I can get on top of the platform. And then after that, I'm going to place some convenient bombs. Now something to know about using both circle and square bombs is you can use them at different points. So you can lay them down and set them down at different points in order to activate switches. This allows you to get some pretty specific control over um, various things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a platform like far away off to one side and place a bomb on top of it. And this means that when I use this bomb explosion, I want to make sure that the, the radius is far enough away that I don't break this block with my other explosion, but close enough that the radius will hit the switch. So next I'm going to place my other bomb on the other side. This will allow me to use this explosion over here. Now I can also hit the switch using arrows or rotating the thing over there to make the laser go around as well. And that would be another potential option too. So one way to solve this portion of it is you can just rotate the duber once again and then this will give you a delayed reaction with the laser so that it will spin around and then it will hit the crystal switch so that you have time to swim over here and get up into this platform before the water level lowers. So that's one way of doing it, otherwise you can also use bombs. So here for example I am moving over this metal barrel and then I'm going to go ahead and activate one of my bombs, doesn't matter which one. So I've activated them as long as the radius of the explosion is far enough away where it doesn't destroy my cryonis block with the opposing bomb, then I'm fine. So I can either do that or use the rotating duber either way. Go ahead and place the metal barrel on top of the switch that was in the lowered water earlier. This will open up a nearby doorway that allows us to get to the end. Now, real quick, there is an extra chest. However, in order to do that, we have to have the water level raised. And in order to do this, the easiest way is to use bombs, which is why I was showing that more complicated method. You didn't have to use two bombs. You could have just used one and used this finny duber earlier. But I just think it's cool to use two bombs. It just makes me feel a little more awesome. I just seriously think that boomerangs are some of the worst items in the game. They're just bad. Like, I don't know, you throw them with R1. I think the idea is cool because they throw, they have like a different firing pattern or whatever compared to other weapons. I think it's a cool idea. I just don't think the execution actually ends up being that great. They're just not worth it. Like, other weapons just do more damage. If I really wanted to do good range damage, I'd use with arrows, you know? It just, I don't know. I think it's a cool idea. It just doesn't really end up being super cool, in my opinion. I do know some people that really like tri Lazal boomerangs, though. Uh, but I'll be talking about all the best farming locations for stuff like that later as well. In case there's some of you who really prefer boomerang weapons, I think, yeah, I, like I said, I think boomerang weapons are terrible, but if you really like them, I will provide you with... Uh, the farming locations for that later on. So as a quick reminder, if you still have thorns around this because they reappeared, that's probably because you either didn't burn them up in the first place or you entered the shrine before they were all completely burned up and then they just reappear. So if that happens, just set them on fire again and this time wait for them to go away. So next, hop back on your horse, continue on towards the east to get to the neighbor tower. In the meantime, I will continue talking about rods because rods are awesome, which is elemental, my dear Watson, elemental. So, the regular rods are terrible, but the blizzard rod, the meteor rod, and the thunderstorm rod are significantly better, so I'm just going to talk about those. Who cares about the other ones, right? Alright, so let's talk about the thunderstorm rod. As a quick reminder, shock weapons will do additional damage to enemies that are wet, and I believe it's typically, um, sometimes it's 10 damage ad additional, sometimes it's 20 damage additional. I think the higher quality ones always do 20 additional damage on top of the regular shock damage. Um, so that's when enemies are wet. So a really good thing to use when it's raining. So whenever it's raining like this, you're like, you know what I mean? Like everyone's like, oh, rain is horrible in Breath of the well, but you know what? If you start thinking about it in terms of shock weapons, uh, rain is kind of awesome because <laughs> you just murder everything. So anyways, um, thunderstorm rod in the rain is amazing. So um, anyways, the thunderstorm rod shoots out three balls that do 30 damage a piece. And if it's raining, that it does an additional flat 20 damage. So what that means is if you can hit them with all three of the lightning balls, you'll do 90 damage plus an additional 20 because they're wet. Now, one weird nuance to know about that, though, is if you are too close, then it only does the damage of one of the lightning balls. And I don't know why this is. Um, so you have to be a little bit further away in order for it to accurately damage all them with all of the balls. So it's actually this like real sweet spot where you have to be just the right distance away where you're far enough away that all three balls do damage, but also like close and yeah, you have to be close enough that all three balls hit them, but far enough away that they actually take damage from all three of them, which is kind of strange. So ideally you do like fat enemies 
um, when it's raining outside would be ideal and or enemies that are wearing a bunch of like metal weapons and shields you know then you can disarm them with that as well so like guardian stalkers are like really easy because they're so huge it's like impossible to miss so that's great um, but also guardian scouts in shrines I think are actually great too you can find that so they're, they're fat enough you can hit them with all three balls and so you do a lot of damage it's also great because it stuns them it doesn't disarm them but um, it just keeps them stunned the entire time so what's cool about that is you find that sweet spot and you're just like smack 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 and like you just keep them perma stunned the entire time they can't go anywhere they can't do anything they're just dying like crazy it's it's awesome as a quick note about what's happening on screen this is the best place in the entire game to farm for bright-eyed crabs um i don't really think this ingredient is super awesome or anything it's just kind of okay but it is a nice safe place so like if you're wanting to farm for some things and you don't really like dealing with enemies this is kind of a nice option it is just a green stamina item though it doesn't give you yellow stamina yellow stamina is better because it rest completely restores all your green stamina too um i just think this is an interesting one to point out as far as a farming location so next we have the meteor rod now this also has the three fireballs so similar to the thunderstorm rod you want to be close enough where the fireballs all hit the enemy but far enough away that all three of the fireballs actually do damage because if you're too close then you'll only do the damage of one fireball make sense so there's a sweet spot where you need to be just the right distance now what the fi the meteor rod does any fire weapon will always kill frost enemies instantly so it is pretty cool for taking with you to hebra because it'll provide heat and it kills all the enemies instantly and it has a pretty big area of effect because it shoots out multiple fireballs so it's cool for that you know it has a multi-purpose use there um, but otherwise what the, the fire does is it sets enemies on fire now ironically enough when you get set on fire you take additional damage over time when enemies get on set, set on fire they don't what happens is it just if they're on fire for a little while then their weapon will get burned up if it has a wooden haft so if a weapon is not just a solid metal weapon and it has some wood on it, then them them being on the on fire status will then burn their weapon, which um, I feel like that's pretty useless. I don't see the point in that really, but it just kind of man because honestly, like most of the lower tier weapons are the ones that are wooden anyways. All the higher tier weapons are solid metal regardless. So it's like. It's kind of like, it's just only really good against killing weak enemies, I guess, so, which it feels bad. The Thunderstorm Rod is just better, it just does more damage. However, the really cool thing about the Meteor Rod, which is sort of a the neat little hidden thing that I think most people don't realize, is the fact that the burn damage is higher. And, I, and I'm talking about grass. So if you set grass on fire, right, with any weapon, you're like, yeah, I can do that with a fire sword, whatever. What you don't realize is that the burn damage from grass is twice as high with the meteor rod. So if you set a field on fire with a meteor rod, it does 20 damage per second to you and enemies versus a regular fire weapon that only does 10 damage per second to enemies. So what's really cool is if you have a big open field, you can just absolutely destroy Bokoblins and Moblins and Lynels using the meteor rod by setting the field on fire. So um, it's a kind of a fun way to kill Lynels. So several of them are in open fields and meteor rod is amazing for that, which is probably not what you expected. So anyways, the big advantage of the meteor rod is actually setting grass on fire, not fighting enemies directly which I know is weird. It's kind of a weird thing to wrap your mind around. So that being said, what I'd recommend you do is you use the meteor rod when it's not raining and use the thunderstorm when it is raining. And like likewise, you use the thunderstorm rod against people with metal weapons and you use the meteor rod for enemies with wooden weapons. Make sense? So there is actually a purpose. In some ways, they're like the exact same weapon. They're just for opposite purposes. But yeah, meteor rod, the damage potential for meteor rod is really, really high. And it's also a very, very easy weapon to commit suicide with because if you set a field on fire, you're just going to burn up and die. <laughs> so just be very careful when you use it, but it is a lot of fun. So lastly, we have the Blizzard Rod, which is the most powerful of all the different rods. What it does is it freezes enemies, and it has a big cone unlike the regular Ice Rod. So it has this huge cone that hits everything in front of you, like amazingly, huge area of effect. Um, kills all the fire enemies instantly, and it freezes everybody else. So frozen enemies take three times damage from the next physical attack. So what you do is you use a Blizzard Rod, then you swap to, like, say, a really hard-hitting two-hander. Say the Edge of Duality does 50 damage, right? So you do 150 damage instead. So you just hit really, really hard, and then you can just instantly switch back, switch back to the Blizzard Rod and do it again. So you can keep an enemy perma-stunned, and you can kill them no problem. Makes going through Hyrule Castle super easy. Also, fun fact, frozen enemies can be pushed around with your body. So if you're on an upper ledge or whatever, you can just push them off the ledge, they'll fall down and shatter and instantly die. Or you can push them into water, for example, and they'll drown. It's just great. It's, it's so dumb. It's so strong. All right, Lanayru Tower. So Lanayru is kind of like from Igis Bridge. It goes up north of Kakariko, goes up and around, follows the water. Then it cuts across Samasa Plain, follows the water over here, goes all the way up here. And this part's super annoying. All these islands, Tingle Island all the way to Davdi Island, these are all part of Lanayru. Even though you can technically get it from there from Tal Tal Peak, you can fly over. But most of the time, basically, everybody's going to like up here near Ulria Grotto and then Grotto and then sailing over. So basically you get to here from Akala, 
but it's not considered part of a call, it's part of Lanayru, which is stupid. Anyways, I disagree with this. So this is part of Lanayru, so Lanayru goes up and woo, includes all these stupid little islands, and then it goes back down and goes along this whole mountain range. Now this is like practically impossible to climb. You can do it, but really hard. So anyways, don't climb this. And then it comes like across this road basically, and then it goes up along the river, and then finally cuts across. So Crenel Peak is part of Lanayru, Crenel Hills is part of uh, uh, Hyrule Field, whatever. Cuts across here, and finally goes down along the river back down to the ridge. So that's all Lanayru. So just this whole little chunk right here, plus these islands way over here. Um, quick comments about this. One of the things to know about Lanayru, Lanayru is annoying. It has all these like wetlands areas, and that's all right. A little bit scary, but not too bad. But the this whole area around Zora's Domain, it rains all the time, which is part of why it's like practically impossible to climb around here is because it's raining. Now, just so you know, that rain is only, it rains all the time until Varuda, until you just gain access. You don't have to beat it even. As long as you just gain access to it, then all the rain stops. So this area is super obnoxious until you complete the main storyline enough where you gain access to Varuda and then the rain stops. Now, as far as stuff you can get here, just so you know, uh, most of the stuff in this whole area, I think is actually kind of bad. Like for example, you know, like there'll be, uh, there's some fish in the water all along the river and they're okay. Like there's, there's a, a fish here, there's a fish there, there's a fish there. Most of the fish though are like tier one or tier two. So they're not very good. Um, tier three fish is like a single like hardy salmon or hardy bass, whatever, like right there, for example. And then there's like, a, I don't even know, some other like stamina shrooms or something like, or stamina fish or whatever they're called. Stamico bass, that's what I'm looking for, the word I'm looking for up here in Toto Lake. But like other than that, there's not really good fish anywhere here at all. There's like frogs, which frogs are like okay. And then there's like... I don't know, some bugs here and there, but there's nothing really super cool. It's like all the farming stuff here is bad because like, like I was just talking about here, there's like one hardy bass. Like that's not worth going way out of your way. It's not close to a shrine. It's really far away. There's only one of them anyways. It's just a terrible farming place. So anyways, you can get goodies in around Zora's Domain, but there's, it's all kind of garbage. So anyways, I would say there is like some good things for frogs, especially right here. This area is kind of cool for like that kind of stuff. There's a bunch of frogs around here in Mikau Lake. But um, other than that, there's not really anything cool over here. Similarly, um, down here, there's, this is a pretty decent spot for um, whatever it's called. I don't even know why I can't think of it right now. The speed things. Um, Fleet Lotus Seed. There's Fleet Lotus Seed like around here and a bunch near Lineback Island right there, which is pretty good. Um, and that's kind of the only other notables here in Lanayru. So as far as more important things, this beach is pretty cool. This is the best place in the entire game to get bright-eyed crabs. Now bright-eyed crabs are a tier 2 energizing ingredient, but there's like 11 or 15 of them all along here. It varies. Um, but energizing ingredients are just kind of okay, so it's up to you to decide whether you want this particular pin. I just think it's worth noting because there's so many of them, and they're super easy. There's no enemies here, so it's just like, well, there's like an Octorok here that shoots at you occasionally, but other than that, nothing. But a better place than that, this is kind of the only really worthwhile pin in Lanayru, in my opinion. Um, and that is, well, technically, I think Telta Lake. You know, Telta Lake, I think, is technically part of Lanayru. It's not explored with, uh, with the Dueling Peaks Tower. Telta Lake is kind of cool, I guess. I guess technically this is part of this. Um... Total Lake has a whole bunch of just random tier 2 enemy or guys. There's a bunch of Stamico Bass and stuff like that that are pretty close. So it's a bunch of random stuff. Like you make a Cryonis block and then throw a bomb down and kill like six fish at a time and hop in and grab them all. It's all a whole bunch of random stuff. So there would be like some energizing ones, some, some heart ones and whatever. But it's just a whole bunch of little stuff. But there's an interesting variety of stuff here. So I think it's kind of neat. Again, not, it's just kind of an honorable mention. I don't think it's super great. Um, but I think the best pin here by far is this forest just south of Wetland Stable. This area has a ton of Enduring Shrooms as well as um, Hardy Radishes. Now those are kind of both mid, mid to low tier of Enduring and Hardy. However, any Hardy ingredients will fill up all your hearts. Same thing with Enduring stuff. Any, heart, any Enduring Shroom will completely restore all of your green stamina and a little bit of your yellow. So if you cook a single Endura Shroom by itself, you can make a dish that will completely restore all of your stamina, which is awesome compared to like getting four or five of these stupid crabs. You know, you, you, you get all the crabs here, you make two or three dishes. Meanwhile, you go here and you can make like 15 dishes of each of hardy and stamina stuff. You know what I mean? It's just crazy. So this is just such a better farming place comparatively that this is overall not worth it. But uh, whatever you want to do there, this is a, a fairly nice spot as well. Um, it does rain more often here than a lot of other places. However, 
it isn't raining continually after you gain access to this. So just as a quick comment, if you did want to farm here, um, kind of the only place in here I think that's worthwhile is actually the shrine itself. So you warp here, it's surrounded by Fleet Lotus Seed and um, like hot-footed frogs. And then if you go upstairs, there's also a bunch of sneaky river snails in the little pools where all the little kids Zora are like waiting around in there. So you can get all those too. So that's all great. Um, and as another comment, one last thing worth noting is I know a lot of people associate Polymus Mountain with getting shock arrows. However, just as a comment, like you are way better off getting money and then going to shops and getting shock arrows. Like if you want shock arrows, um, go to shops, like get them down here. Go all the way to uh, Luralin Village or go to, um, I think you can buy shock arrows here as well in Rito Village. I'm actually not sure where all the shock ones are. Regardless, you go to all the shops, buy them instead, and you'll be way far ahead. I know they're expensive. It's like 420 rupees for a stack of, or for three stacks of 10 or whatever, but that's 30 arrows. Like, look at it this way. If you can spend 420 rupees to get 30 arrows, right? Meanwhile, Polymus Mountain, you're lucky if you get like 15 or 20 or something like that. Whatever. I don't know how many is up here, but uh, they respawn every Blood Moon. And yes, they're free, but you're sneaking around or whatever. Let's say, let's just say for the sake of argument that it takes you 20 minutes. And I think that's actually being really efficient. I bet you it takes you longer than that. It takes you 20 minutes to go from this shrine to go all the way up here and sneak around and grab all these very, very carefully. So if you did that, 20 minutes, then meanwhile, you could farm for things that you can sell for even 100 rupees. Let's say you can, you're can you farming for, especially dragon parts. Dragon parts, you can get 300 rupees every 15 seconds. So if you spend half an hour there, you'll get 36,000 rupees, which that's a ton. Like, <laughs> I don't know, you know what I mean? Like you sell, or you cook some dishes, like you cook a bunch of fish or whatever, and you make like 150 rupees a piece on that, and you just cook like, I don't know, or even this. You run around here, you gather everything up, then you cook it all into dishes, you sell it all, you make all the money you need to get all the stuff. Like, I don't know. It's faster, I guess, than going up here. It's less dangerous, you make more money, you get all your shock arrows instantly, and you get like twice as many, you get 30 shock arrows instead of 10 or whatever, it's just better. So anyways, um, that's everything in Lanayru. Um, I would say overall the best thing by far is this guy, but, yep. So next I decided to sail north to the So Kofi, Kofi, the So Coffee Shrine, So Coffee. Um, so this, I don't want to do it right now because it is a minor test of strength. I'm going to do all the tests of strength here in just a second. So that's actually going to be in the next video. So uh, I will be doing those here in a little bit, but I decided I wanted to do them all at once so I could have an attack buff for the entire duration. Now, next, I went over to my horse, but unfortunately some of these style enemies appeared right at the same time. And this both put my horse in the water as well as made these guys continually chasing after me. There's several of them and I, I could probably deal with it, but I decided it was faster to just go ahead and warp away. By the way, whenever you go to a tower or a shrine, there's always like an overhang of a of it so you can totally use that to make a campfire and I like to do this to change the time of day because um, I can do that in this case I'm doing it to make it morning but also you can do that to get rid of rain and I haven't really had to deal with that so far yet but for example right now once I use the campfire now it's raining I could just slash it with my sword one more time to put it back on fire because it's underneath this overhang I can totally use that shelter to allow my campfire to work so anyways just just know that by having a lot of shrines and towers like near wherever you're going to be adventuring you can always use those guaranteed to, like in that example, I just warped away. It didn't matter. I didn't have to fight those enemies at all. And then I just went ahead and went back to my horse. So this did two things for me. It just made it so that I, it's not going to be night wherever I'm going, so I don't have to deal with any style enemies moving forward, but also that I could change the Z weather if I wanted to. So next, I'm continuing on towards the north, and this road here forks several different times. So one of them leads towards Death Mountain on the left. The other one leads towards the tower on the right. And then after a little while, that'll fork off a couple times as well. But basically, I'm trying to go just left of the tower where there is a stable. Now, as a reminder, too, as you're running along these roads, um, I still didn't realize at this point in the recordings that the horse would automatically snap to the road So I'm constantly adjusting for it all the time, but it's actually it's pretty straightforward All you have to do is as long as you're pretty close to the road or you're like aimed towards it The horse will automatically snap to it and just follow it automatically So you don't have to steer the only time that's really necessary is if you're wanting to specifically leave the road Or you're trying to choose which direction to go once the road forks So once you get to a fork in the road then make sure you choose it So in this case farther onto the north I chose to the left and then I need to go up this hill because there is a shrine here so welcome to the Zekasho Shrine. Zekasho or Z Kasho. I'm not sure. There's nothing to make that E say E, so I think it would just be Z. But anyways, um, this first apparatus, what you want to do is there's two of these spikes that are like uh, vertical, I guess, and then two of them that are horizontal. What I recommend you do is just put the vertical ones to the far side. So what you want to do is have like the two horizontal ones kind of in the middle, and then you can just lean forward, and the two vertical ones will go away. Now, just so you know, the underside of this apparatus is all total spikes, so there is nothing. There's no goodies under there, no hidden chests or anything. 
building. Once you finally make an open path, you want to continue on towards the next room. And here we have a crystal switch that will temporarily deactivate all these lasers. Um, unfortunately, just so you know, a lot of uh, puzzles like this in a lot of shrines, the lasers are usually tall enough where you can duck underneath them. Um, that does not work for this particular shrine, so they are too tall, or yeah, too low and so you can't duck underneath them. So what you want to do is hit the crystal switch. You can do this using the bow, you can use your sword if you're close enough, or you can use bombs. Something that's kind of fun you can do is you can place a bomb on either side of it and make it far enough away where you can activate the bombs at different points. And as a result, then you can activate the switch whenever you want without having to shoot it with an arrow. So if you don't like shooting with arrows, like for example, I don't have very many. So that would be an alternative to that. Now, one of the things that happens when you hit the crystal switch is there is a platform, like a square block there at the far end that will keep rotating all around. So what you want to do is you want to get it in position to where it's underneath the platform you're currently on. And then you, then you want to hit that crystal switch with something. And then you can go ahead and hop on top of the square platform and use it to reach this far side. Now, the one thing that's a little bit tricky about this is you do need to like get over onto the far side as it's like rotating around. That is a little bit tricky. They do have this little lip to try and grab you too. Um, sometimes I find it easier to actually, rather than running, is I duck and then just like crawl off the edge basically, and that works pretty good. Also, just one quick tip for that room too is you can also use stasis on those lasers as well. The actual like device on the end that spits out the laser, you can just stasis that and that will make it temporarily stop. Of course, then you have to wait for each one. So that's a much slower process. You can get through that room that way. Like for example, when I got stuck, when I was crawling underneath it the first time and it didn't work, I could have just used stasis instead. In the next room, we have one of these balancing acts with the uh, balls where you're trying to get them to land on all of the switches, which is pretty straightforward. Nothing really too much to say about it. It is, it can be a little bit awkward. Unfortunately, that like square at the top is really annoying. I think it just messes everything up. Now, just so you know, with all of these um, apparatus puzzles where you have a dispenser right above it, um, th there's actually a lot of them in the game that like this and what you can do is actually use this to your advantage by simply knocking them into the abyss on purpose and then they'll start dispensing now just as a note they only dispense one at a time and you can use this to your advantage because you can rotate the apparatus wherever you want and makes it really easy to make them land exactly where you want them to go now another fun fact about that too like you can get one and get it to land in a slot and then all you have to do is like you can tilt the platform so that once the next ball lands, that it's already rolling in the direction you want it to go. Whenever they first land, they always have like a little bit of momentum to them, so you can actually use that to your advantage. It's a little bit tricky, but um, yeah, I think overall this is just way easier than alternative methods for this. So once you've completed that puzzle, this will open the nearby door, which allows us to access the old bro. Now at this point, I have 12 spirit orbs, and so that's a nice solid amount. We need four of them to turn in each one, or yeah, to get a, a heart container or a stamina vessel, you need four of each. So I can get three different upgrades right now, which is awesome. So I'm gonna swing over to Kakariko real quick and get three stamina vessels. I think this is overall a bigger benefit for right now. But yeah, um, the goddess statues, there's one of them in each one of the major towns and some of the like little more minor villages as well. But anyways, there's, there's a bunch of these goddess statues all over the place. I think Kakariko is nice and obvious. It's easy to find. It's right in the middle of town or whatever, but all of you should have access to this at this point. So yeah, as far as between heart containers and stamina vessels, I think early on that stamina vessels are way more beneficial. Like, uh, I guess maybe a, a better way to explain it is you need, you need to have like at least two or three heart containers before it actually starts giving you a benefit, if that makes sense. Just one or two is not good enough. You need to have like three or more um, in a yeah, so if you have six total heart containers, that's when it starts being worth it to do that. So be until we get more stamina vessels, it's not worth it for now. It, we're much better off doing stamina. Plus, we're gonna be doing a lot of climbing in the next little while. So this is the point where we're gonna start climbing like crazy. So I recommend you, the more stamina you have, the better. It'll make this next section a lot easier. So. Next, I'm warping back over to Zakasho and heading down to the stable over here. I was saying earlier that I needed to change my horse gear. I was going to wait until I got to the next stable, so now I'm finally doing that at long last. So how this works is there's a chick over on the right side of the stable. Not all stables have a girl here, but a lot of them do. So anyways, um, if you find a stable that has one of these chicks, you want to bring your horse over to her and then speak with her. And what will happen is she will then check and see what your horse's trust stat is. Now, as long as your trust stat is maxed out, then you can do stuff here with your horse and um, she'll, she'll, she'll tell you how happy your horse is. But you can also check when you try to board them, it'll tell you what the numerical value is. Um, and you gain trust by just riding your horse around and also by feeding them apples and enduring carrots. Apples are by far cheaper if you want to accelerate that process and get them happy as soon as possible. Just throw a whole bunch of them on the ground, your horse will walk around and eat them and stuff like that. I think they only eat like four or five at a time though, so you can like run around with them for a little bit and then feed them more and stuff, but that'll work. Anyways, um, the goal is to get your horse up to 100 trust. It doesn't take that long actually. If you've been riding around with me for a while, you should easily have 100 trust and it's not a problem. You can also feed your horse enduring carrots and this will provide a 
temporary buff that will increase the number of spurs that your horse has. However, it's only really necessary when traveling. If you're trying to increase happiness, I highly recommend apples because it's just way more efficient. But in general, I'd actually recommend you save your enduring carrots to make dishes out of because they're pretty valuable. I would way rather have like pages of enduring carrot dishes as opposed to just having like a temporary or just increasing happiness on my horse. You know what I mean? Especially when I can do the same thing with apples. Apples are cheap. Um, anyways, I'm going to speak with the chick here. And as long as your horse's happiness is happy enough, if you have 100 trust, which is super easy to get, then you can swap out your horse gear. So at this point, I'm going to swap out for the DLC stuff that I got, which is the um, ancient bridle and the ancient saddle. Now, I'll put links in the description for the related videos for when I found these particular items. But yes, these are DLC only. What they allow you to do is you can press down on the D-pad to summon your horse whenever you want, as long as you're in an appropriate zone that lets you do that. But very useful thing. It allows you to summon your horse anywhere in Hyrule for the most part, and it's great. It makes your it just makes your horse way more practical to use. That's super good. It's like one of the best features of the DLC, in my opinion. But yeah, huge thanks goes out to all of my Patreon supporters for helping to make this possible. And if you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, be sure to throw a like on it, subscribe, and stay tuned for more content just like this. Remember to stay awesome, you have an amazing day, and then join me for the next video where we'll continue on with our Circuit of Hyrule collecting all the towers.